Hello, hello. We're live now. Hi, everyone. Hey, I everyone. Always like, I always feel like a rock star when I'm live on YouTube, even though I don't play any instruments. But <laughs> <laughs> hey, everyone. Um, super happy for the people who are joining. Super happy for the people who have already joined. Uh, this is Manav. Uh, we are Product Tank Austria because we are two Product Tanks together. Yes. Product Tank Linz and Product Tank Vienna. Uh, super happy that you guys have joined us. So let's start our really special event and move it forward. So. Are we on? Nice. There we go now. Now my slides are moving. So yeah, uh, why product tank and mind the product? We always reiterate this for every of our events uh, that we do for the past year and a half. Uh, but more to show is that our communities are only possible with the love that you guys are giving to us. Uh, we are a community-based uh, organization, so it really provides value when everyone joins. And that is the mission and vision for product tank. We are mind the product. Uh, for Product Tank Linz, uh, the two core organizers are myself, Manav, and my colleague uh, for Product Tank is also Simon. Uh, coincidentally, he turns out to be my work colleague. In the work environment, he's not that fun, but in this environment, he seems to be <laughs> funny. So, yeah, it works out. You know, you get two types of personas of people <laughs> in two different environments. And uh, joining with us is also Product Tank Vienna. So, I'll let Mona introduce herself. Yes, hi everyone from me as well, from Product Tank Vienna. Uh, unfortunately, Lila couldn't be with us tonight, but she sends her best. And uh, yeah, we basically uh, took over Product Tank Vienna, I think uh, in October 2020, I think it was, so almost going uh, for a year now. And um, yeah, but now enough about us. Um, I would like to introduce our um, amazing speaker for tonight, uh, who is here with us. It's Teresa Torres, who you have probably already heard about, um, but let me say a few words about Teresa here. Um, so Teresa is an internationally acclaimed author, speaker and coach. Um, and she, of course, has largely contributed to the product community through her blog, um, producttalk.org, and um, also many amazing sessions at product conferences throughout the, the years, and um, also most recently through her book, Continuous Discovery Habits. Um, so at the end, you will have the chance to ask Teresa questions. Um, and please ask your questions in the YouTube comments um, that you see on your right. Um, and Teresa will answer those at the end um and yeah so we have teresa already on our stage hi teresa thank you so much for joining us again and the stage is yours excellent thank you for having me all right welcome to the what and why of continuous discovery um i teresa torres i like to share that i've worked with teams all over the world um in a wide variety of industries some teams as small as two-person startups all the way up to large multinational companies with hundreds of thousands of employees. Part of the reason why I share that at the beginning of the talk is that I know what it's like to sit in the audience and feel like, oh, these methods and tactics can work for places like Google and Facebook and Apple, uh, but they're never going to work in my context. And so what I want to share is that the framework and the tactics we're going to talk about have been tested in a lot of different environments. One of my personal goals is to help make continuous discovery uh, more sustainable for t people in all types of environments. Uh, so I want to really encourage you to think about um, how you might bring some of this back to your organization. And when we get into the Q&A, we can certainly talk about um, how you might do that. Okay, so I want to start at the very beginning and talk about discovery versus delivery. So these terms are fairly new. Um, we've been talking about it for the last, say, five to 15 years, depending on what you might have been exposed to. Um, but in the last few years, they've really grown in popularity. Um, when we talk about discovery, we're talking about the work we're doing to decide what to build. And we often contrast this with delivery, the work that we're doing to build, uh, ship, and maintain a production quality product. It really is this simple. Now, the other construct I want to introduce is this idea of a proje uh, project versus continuous discovery. So most of us grew up in a project world. Um, our companies probably still operate in a project world in at least some senses. 
where there's this idea of we have an annual budgeting process, we resource um, projects at the beginning of the year, teams get assigned a project, when we ship it, we typically call the project done and move on to the next project. The reason why we're seeing the industry move away from a project mindset is because we're learning that digital products are never done. It's not that Netflix released their streaming entertainment platform and then walked away to their next business, right? They continue to iter on, iterate on it, they continue to improve it. Um, and we're recognizing that with digital products in particular, we have really good customer feedback loops and we can visibly see how we can iterate and evolve and improve our products. And that's becoming critical for staying ahead of competitors. And so as a result, that's leading to a shift from a project mindset to a continuous mindset. So I wanna start with just a really clear definition of continuous discovery. This comes from my book, Continuous Discovery Habits. Uh, I define continuous discovery as weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product where they conduct small research activities in pursuit of a desired product outcome. Now there's a lot to this definition, so we're gonna break it down line by line. Let's start with weekly touch points with customers. I wanna start with just this cadence. If you've never talked to a customer, this might feel a little bit overwhelming. So I wanna encourage you throughout the talk to take a continuous improvement mindset, even to these practices. You don't have to be perfect starting tomorrow. Um, really think about this as a benchmark to aspire to. So why is this weekly cadence so important? As product people, we're making decisions every day, right? Some of them are big strategic decisions like which customer should we serve, what outcome should we go after. Others are more everyday decisions like what do we label this button? How should this workflow work? What should the underlying data model support? Most of us know that those big strategic decisions need some research, but we often forget that those daily decisions can also benefit from customer input. And the reason for this is as product people, when we're working on a digital product all day, every day, we start to develop expertise in our products. We know where everything is, we know what functionality is available, we know how everything works, we know all the workflows, and our customers don't have that same depth of expertise about our product. It turns out there's this bias called the curse of knowledge that basically says we can't remember what it was like to not have our expert knowledge. And so as we develop expertise in our product, we start making decisions from our own expert point of view, and we, we create this situation where our decisions aren't necessarily gonna work for our customers because they don't share that expertise. So one of the key reasons why we want to engage with customers every week is we're trying to close the gap between how we think about the product and how our customers think about the product. We wanna catch when we're making decisions that are from our own expert point of view that aren't gonna work for our customers. So thankfully, when we talk about engaging with customers every week, we're not talking about big project-based research that we're gonna do every week. We're gonna get into how to make this teeny tiny so it's sustainable. Um, there's another advantage to engaging with customers every single week. And that's for a lot of us in a project-based world, we only conduct what I call validation research. So validation research is when we do all the design work up front and then when we're done, we validate through usability testing, did we get the design right? Or we do all the delivery work up front and then when we're done, we validate through A-B testing, did we build the right thing? Validation research isn't a bad thing. We do need to do validation research at the end of the design and the end of delivery, but it's not our best, those are not our best tools for discovery, right? Because we've done all the design work or all the delivery work before we learn if it was the right thing. So when we engage with customers every week, there's another advantage. It also helps us to unlock what I call a co-creation mindset, where we're getting feedback from customers along the way. We're getting feedback from customers before we've chosen a problem to solve, when we're still working with half-baked ideas, when our designs are pencil sketches. The advantage of this is it's a lot easier to integrate customer feedback when our designs aren't polished, when our code isn't written. So by engaging with customers earlier and throughout the process, we're much more likely to actually act on their feedback and improve our product based on those customer interactions. Now, whenever I talk about co-creation with customers, somebody in the audience is typically thinking of one of two quotes. The first is when Steve Jobs said, customers don't know what they want until we show it to them. 
And the second is where Henry Ford allegedly said if I'd asked customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So I want to be clear. When I talk about co-creating with customers, I'm not talking about um, asking customers what they want. We're not going to go to customers and say, what should we build? And you'll see a little bit later, we're going to get into how do we interview well to get reliable responses and to help us co-create. But for now, I just want you to remember, we're not going to, we're not going to just build feature requests that our customers ask for. We're not going to let our customers dictate the solution. That's not what I mean by co-creation. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to learn from our customers about who they are, about the world, about their context, about their needs, pain points, and desires. And we're going to synthesize that with our understanding of um, what's possible with technology and co-create a better solution together. Okay, so we've covered this first line of the definition, weekly touch points with customers. Let's get into the second line, by the team building the product. So this starts with this idea of the product trio. So a product trio is typically comprised of a product manager, a designer, and a tech lead. This is the team that is leading discovery. Now I want to be clear here, we don't have a discovery team that's handing off to a delivery team. This trio is also on the delivery team. So it's one team. Um, but what we're seeing is this, if we get this group collaborating together from the beginning on decisions about what to build, we end up building better stuff. So I want to contrast this with what we've historically done. Historically, the product manager has written requirements, handed it off to the designer who does all the design work, and then the requirements and the design get handed off to engineers who then implement. What's wrong with this world of handoffs? Two things. With every handoff, we lose context and nuance. We're getting further and further away from the customer. And we see a lot of rework. Right? The product manager writes requirements, they go to the designer, the designers run into design constraints. We have to change the requirements and then change the designs again. We hand them off, that's finally finalized, we hand them off to the engineers. And the engineers run into design cons or technical constraints and again we have to go all the way back to rewriting requirements, redoing design. And so what we're learning is that if we get this group collaborating from the beginning, we reduce the handoffs, the whole team stays close to the customer, and we end up building better products. Now I want to be clear, this is not the only group that's involved in discovery. Most of us have more folks on our team. We probably have more than one engineer. Depending on your DevOps strategy, you might still have QA folks on your team or release managers or operations folks. Depending on how you interface with the rest of the business, you might have data analysts or customer success folks or product marketing managers on your team. Maybe you have the luxury of, it, of having a user researcher on your team. Honestly, this slide could have had 40 roles on it. We now have a lot of variation in product roles. I'm not trying to exclude any role. Here's the underlying principle of a product trio. We want the right cross-functional roles in the room given the type of decision that we're making. So if you work on a data heavy product and your data analyst needs to be involved in all the decisions, your trio is now a quad. If you're working on the discovery for your go to market strategy, your product marketing manager is going to join for those decisions. So this idea is flexible. We can include more people as the decisions warrant it. We can include more people based on the roles that we have on our team. The thing that's important to recognize is that we're going to the makeup of the trio, we're trading off speed of decision making with quality of decision making. So the more people involved in a decision, the slower you're going to go. But we do want the right roles represented because cross-functional collaboration is what leads to better decision making. Now, if this is the team that's driving decisions, discovery decisions, this is the team that we want engaging with customers on a weekly basis. And that's because this is the team that needs to make sure they're not suffering from a curse of knowledge and starting to make expert decisions instead of decisions that will work for customers. Okay, so we've talked about weekly touch points with customers by the team building the product. So this starts with the product trio at a minimum engaging with customers weekly. What are they doing in those customer touch points? So the second half of the definition is where we're going to really paint a clear picture of what does continuous discovery look like in practice. And there's a few key elements I want to highlight. The first is that the team is conducting small research activities week over week. 
So we're not going to take our project-based research activities and try to jam them into a weekly cadence. That would simply burn ourselves out. Instead, we're going to adjust our research activities to support a continuous cadence. And the key is that we're not doing research for research sake. We're doing research to help us pursue the best path to our desired outcome. And there's a visual that I'm going to introduce. It's called an opportunity solution tree. This visual will help a product trio track the best path to their outcome. And it starts with defining a clear outcome. And this might be a new concept for some of you um, because it is different from what we've historically done. So historically, we've managed product teams by outputs. We give them a roadmap and say, please deliver this roadmap. Or we ask them to create a roadmap and say, please deliver this roadmap. Roadmaps assume that we can predict the future. They assume that in January, we know what we should be building in March or May. And if we look at 2020, it's a pretty good lesson in why roadmaps are hitting their limitations. If in January of 2020, you planned your year, that year was completely disrupted in March when we all started working from home. And it was definitely probably disrupted again in May and June when we recognized that the economy around the, the global economy was going to be shut down for quite some time. What we're seeing as an industry is we're recognizing that while we don't face a global pandemic every year, hopefully that's the case, um, we do see um, new technology disrupt what's possible. We see new competitors enter the market. Even our own code releases impact our customers' behavior. And so we're recognizing that we need to be more adaptable than managing by outputs and instead move the scope to looking at what's the impact we're trying to create. So when we shift from outputs to outcomes, we're saying, we're not sure what we should build. We want to remain adaptable and listen to the market, but we know we need to create this type of value for the business. So I'm going to give you an example of this. I'm going to use Netflix in my examples, not because they sponsor me. I've actually never worked with Netflix, but because people all over the world are, are broadly familiar with streaming entertainment and how it works. So Netflix is a subscription business. You can imagine a key that a key metric for Net for Netflix is to increase subscriber retention. So that's a, that's a clear outcome. That's a way of defining how a product team can create, can create business value. They can say, focus on increasing subscriber retention. That's an example of a desired outcome that we're gonna start with. And I wanna emphasize that represents business value. So we're looking at how do we create value for the business. Now, we do want to be customer centric and ensure that we're also creating value for the customer. And this is where we're going to look at discovering opportunities that might drive that outcome. So opportunities represent customer value. They just represent customer needs, pain points, and desires. So we're going to go discover what are the needs, pain points, and desires that if we address them would create customer value in a way that would drive our, bus our business outcome and thus create business value. Now, with that understanding in place, outputs do matter. We do need to discover the solutions that will address those opportunities in a way that will drive our outcome. And so this visual will help us make sure that all of these things stay aligned. And this is really important because the opportunity space is infinite and not all opportunities will drive our outcome. So we're using this visual to help us evaluate the opportunities that we believe have the potential of driving our outcome. So let's talk about how a team might build out this visual. It starts, like I said, it, it does start at the top with defining a clear outcome. Now, in an ideal world, this setting this outcome is a two-way negotiation between your product leader, that's your chief product officer, your vice president of product. If you work at a large company, it might be the general manager of your business unit and that product trio we just talked about. And the reason why this should be a two-way negotiation is because most executives tend to communicate business value and business outcomes. They're gonna say something like, um, please increase subscriber retention in the business world and in the Netflix world, and then the product trio is gonna to have to translate that to a product outcome. So a business outcome typically measures the health of the business. It's usually a financial metric. It's usually tied to your business model, like increased subscriber retention. And your product outcome should measure a behavior that occurs in your product. And so to do that translation, you need a theory of how your product is going to drive business value. So in the Netflix world, what this might look like is they, the product trio might say, we believe if people watch Netflix more, they're going to be more likely to retain. So that's their theory of how the product can support the business outcome. And they might translate that to a product outcome 
of increased viewing minutes or view, increased viewing engagement. With that in place, we're going to start our weekly cadence of customer touch points. And the first small research activity we're going to do on a weekly basis is we're going to interview to discover opportunities. Now remember, an opportunity is a customer need, a customer pain point, and a customer desire. So we're interviewing to discover opportunities, not to evaluate solutions. We'll look at what our second research activity is later that will help us evaluate solutions. Now I want to see teams interviewing customers on a weekly basis. Again, the world around us is always changing. The opportunity space is always shifting. We want to keep an ear to the ground and make sure that we always understand who our customers are and what their current needs, pain points, and desires are. Now the reason most, why most teams don't interview on a weekly basis is because recruiting is the biggest barrier to interviewing every week. It's hard to find people to talk to. So what I recommend teams do is they start by automating the recruiting process. Now this is going to sound magical. I want you to start the week on Monday and look at your calendar and already have an interview scheduled without you having to do anything. I'm going to give you the most, the three most common strategies for how to do this. The first is to recruit people while they're using your product or service. So while you already have your customer's attention, this strategy works really well in B2B or B2C context where, you're, where your consumers are directly using your product or service and in B2B context where you're trying to recruit end users while they're working out of your product. Now, if you pursue this strategy, Think about it like a product funnel. You're going to have to experiment and optimize it. You're going to have to think about where are you going to put this interstitial. It doesn't have to be an interstitial. It can be an interstitial. It can be a pop-up. It can be embedded in the page. But the idea is somewhere within your product, you're asking them for some time in exchange for some incentive or reward. There's a lot of variables here to play with. Where do you show the message? Who do you show it to? How much time do you ask for? What do you offer as an incentive? How far into the future do you let them schedule? How much scheduling availability do you make op do you open up? It will take experimentation to get this right, but I will share probably 80 to 90% of the teams that I work with are using this strategy to automate the recruiting process. Um, and I would recommend that almost everybody start here. If you're trying to recruit B2B, B2B buyers, so they're not in your product or service, you can define triggers for your customer facing teams to help them recruit for you. So what does this look like? You can go to your sales teams, your account management teams, your support teams, and you can say each week, if you're talking to a customer who experiences this need, pain point, or desire, please schedule time on my calendar with them. You can open up blocks of time for them and allow them to just book the interview for you. This is very effective if your customer facing teams are already on the phone with your buyers. Right? At most companies, we have people in the building that are on the phone with customers all day, every day. We're going to use those teams to help us schedule interviews. Again, I cannot emphasize this enough. Across the teams that I work with, these first two strategies are covering 98% of cases. Almost everybody is using one of these two strategies. So if you're listening and you want to automate your recruiting process, I strongly recommend you start with one of these two strategies. I am going to introduce a third strategy. This strategy works in a very special situation and I'm going to encourage that you limit it to those situations. So sometimes our total addressable market is teeny tiny. I'm going to give you two examples. I worked with a company whose customers were US based movie studios. There are six of them. So they had six customers in their total addressable market. I worked with another company where their total addressable market was Canadian medical schools. There's maybe a dozen of them, maybe two dozen. Again, teeny tiny total addressable markets. The second situation where this third strategy is going to be helpful is when your target customer has very little discretionary time. Now we all think we have very little discretionary time, so I'm going to give a couple of examples of this as well. I'm talking about if your customers are Fortune 500 CEOs, and it's not possible to get on their calendar. They're not using your product. They're not customer, talking to your customer facing teams. Another example of this might be physicians and nurses, respiratory physicians and nurses during the height of COVID, right? You're not really going to just capture their time when they come to your product or service. 
So what you can do is you can set up a customer advisory board. The way this works is you're building a long-term relationship with a small number of customers to make it easier to ac access them. I still want you to work with them on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So you're doing one-on-one -on -one interviews. You're not running this like a focus group. And that's because unless you're a skilled facilitator, it's very difficult to get reliable feedback from a focus group. So what you can do here is you can just invite a small number of customers to essentially be design partners. And then you need to incentivize them just like you do in the first strategy. And you're gonna basically, let's imagine you have three product teams. You could invite 12 customers to be part of your customer advisory board. Each of those product teams would have a customer to interview every week for three months in a row as they rotate through the advisory board. And then you would just repeat who you're interviewing um, and interview the same customer four times a year. Okay, I will say almost, almost all of the teams that I have worked with have used one of these three strategies to automate the recruiting process. Once we have a customer in the room, we now need to talk about how do we ask the right questions. This is gonna re require that we know a little bit about how the human brain works and, the, and be aware of cognitive biases. So your number one rule when interviewing is to avoid speculation. So what do I mean by this? If I stick with my Netflix example and I, I wanna know things like, what do you like to watch? How often do you watch? What device do you watch on? Who do you watch with? How do you decide what to watch? I could ask you these questions directly, which is what a lot of product teams do. The challenge is your answers are gonna be pure speculation. This is, for, this is because we rarely take the time to reflect on our own behavior. It's not like over our morning coffee or tea, we sit and think, ooh, I wonder what I like to watch on Netflix. The other reason why these are speculative questions is because cognitive biases interfere. So when we're asked these questions out of context, our brains generate fast answers, but research tells us these answers do not necessarily reflect our actual behavior. So we wanna avoid speculation. We don't wanna ask these who, what, why, how questions in our interviews. Instead, we wanna ask questions that elicit specific stories. So a story-based question is something like, tell me about a specific time when. So in the Netflix example, it could be tell me about the last time you watched Netflix, or tell me about you watched the last time you watched Netflix on the go, or tell me about the last time you had to choose a new show to watch. There's a lot of different types of stories we can collect. When we collect specific stories, the reliability of what we hear goes way up. Humans are not very good at answering questions out of context. We are good at remembering specific instances as long as it's recent enough. I can still get the answers to all of those questions, my who, what, why, how questions, but I wanna get them in the context of a story. So if I ask you to tell me about the last time you watched Netflix, I'm gonna listen for who were you with, what device were you on, how did you decide what to watch, how many episodes did you watch? So I'm still gonna get all the answers I'm looking for, but they're gonna be far more reliable. There's another benefit to story-based interviewing. Opportunities, customer needs, pain points, and desires emerge from our stories. So as we collect stories, we're gonna be able to map out the opportunity space. Now the tree structure of the opportunity solution tree is gonna help us map the opportunity space in a way that allows us to see how we might reach our outcome. We're gonna see all the opportunities that we could pursue, and I want you to make a strategic decision about which opportunity to start with. Once you have a target opportunity, I want you to work with a set of solutions. So we're gonna work with three solutions at a time. Now this is different from what most teams do. Most teams hear a customer need and we jump to our first solution. And even if you're doing all the right research activity, discovery activities, prototype testing, maybe A-B testing, testing your assumptions, if we're working with one idea at a time, we're asking what, deci we're asking what decision, maker re decision making researchers call a whether or not question. We're saying, is this idea good or not? The problem with this framing is that it's gonna exacerbate two different cognitive biases. The first is called the escalation of commitment. The more we work with an idea, the more we identify with the idea, the more likely we're gonna fall in love with that idea. You've probably experienced this, we all have. The second bias this is gonna exacerbate is confirmation bias. Confirmation bias suggests that we're more likely to see the evidence that our idea is fantastic and less likely to see the evidence that our idea is flawed. 
Now, a lot of people misunderstand confirmation bias. They think that as long as they're hearing and acting on negative feedback, they're not falling prey to confirmation bias. That's not true. It's not, confirmation bias doesn't say you're ignoring negative feedback. It suggests that we don't even notice some of it, right? Our brains acting like a filter, we're more likely to notice the positive feedback and completely miss the negative feedback. So even if we're doing all the right things, we're not getting as much value out of our discovery activities as we could if we're working with one idea at a time. So once we have a target opportunity, what we wanna do is we wanna set up a good compare and contrast decision by working with multiple ideas at once and, and asking the question, which of these ideas look best? This framing will trick your brain into evaluating the pros and cons of each of the ideas, so you're much more likely to truly evaluate which idea looks best. Now this compare and contrast idea is important enough that I wanna give you a visual to help you remember it. We just wrapped up the Summer Olympics in Tokyo, um, and I really wanna highlight, this is an image of Usain Bolt. So Usain Bolt used to be the world's fastest 100 meter runner. If I asked you, is Usain Bolt fast? I want you to hear a whether or not question. Is he fast or not? Which means we need something to compare him to. What's our compare and contrast? Is he fast relative to a cheetah? Probably not. Is he fast relative to a Tesla? In the first 100 meters, I would love to see that race. Is he fast relative to other humans? Absolutely. So what we're seeing on the right is a clear compare and contrast decision where we've identified a front runner. This is what we're trying to do when we're evaluating our solutions. We're comparing and contrasting solutions until we have a clear front runner. Now the reason why most teams don't do this, why we don't compare three ideas at once, is because we don't have time to do project-based research for three ideas. We can't do all the design work for three ideas before we learn which one is the right idea. We definitely can't build three ideas and A-B test them to figure out which one is best. That would take too much time. So the second small research activity we're doing on a weekly cadence is we're breaking our ideas down into their underlying assumptions and we're testing those assumptions. Now this assumption testing is what's gonna unlock a faster cadence. It's what's gonna support this compare and contrast decision. Now this is not a new idea. Eric Ries introduced this idea of testing our underlying assumptions 10 years ago in his book, The Lean Startup. The reason why we don't do this is because it's hard to see our underlying assumptions. So I'm gonna give you some strategies for how to do that. We're gonna walk through another Netflix example. I want you to imagine that we interviewed a bunch of Netflix users and we heard over and over again, Netflix is great at TV shows and movies, but I really wanna watch live sports. So we're gonna think about three ways for how we might solve this. The first way is a little bit US centric, but I'll explain it. In the United States, we have three public channels, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Let's take the Olympics for an example. If I wanted to watch the Olympics, their, current, their broadcast in the US on NBC. So one way Netflix could solve this problem is they could integrate a live feed of NBC into their interface. And that would allow their subscribers to watch the, sport, the Olympics live. Um, second way we could solve this problem is they could license game, sporting events directly from the sports leagues. So if we stick with our Olympics example, they could go to the Olympics committee and, and gain streaming rights to all of the Olympic events. And just like they do this with movie studios, they could integrate individual events directly into the Netflix interface. Third solution is Netflix could say, we're not very good at sports, we're not gonna win at sports, let's partner with somebody who already is good at sports. And Fubo TV is a streaming service where they already integrate a lot of the local cable channels, and so they already have sports available on their platform. Okay, so we've got three reasonably good solutions that can each address our target opportunity. How are we gonna figure out which one is our front runner? The key is to break our solutions down into their underlying assumptions. This sounds simple, it's much harder than it sounds because it's, we're often blind to our own assumptions. So I'm gonna help you see assumptions by introducing a few categories. So we tend to make assumptions in, a, in, a, in five categories. You're looking at three of them. You might've seen this Venn diagram before. We often talk about we need to create desirable, viable, and feasible products. 
Turns out these are also the categories that we tend to make assumptions. So we assume, does anybody want our solution? And we make assumptions about why they might want our, our solution. We're also making assumptions about, are they willing to do what we need them to do? So most solutions require that the customer play a role and that they play along. So desirability also covers, are they willing to do what we need them to do? Viability covers our assumptions around, will it create value for our business? Should we build this? If you're an outcome focused team, this is as simple as, will building our solution help us drive our outcome? Feasibility assumptions are, is it possible? Can we build it? Is the technology, is there, will technology, is the, is the technology possible? Do we have the ne necessary skills and abilities on our team? I'm gonna add two categories to this Venn diagram. The first is usability, right? We make a number of assumptions about can people use it? Are they able to do what we need them to do? The last category is ethical assumptions. And as a technology industry, we're pretty terrible at this category. I'm hoping we get better. This is where we should be looking at things like what data would we need to co be collect in order to support this solution? How might we store it? Can we store it safely? How do we plan to use it? Do our customers understand that? Are they okay with that? Are we being transparent with them about that? GDPR took us in a giant step in the right direction, but clearly there's still room for improvement. This is also where we can look at things like who are we choosing to serve and whether that's implicit or whether that's explicit or implicit, asking the question as a result, who are we leaving out? So this is also where we can start to examine social justice and inequity issues and start to evaluate, are we replicating those inequities that we see in our communities in the products that we're building? Okay, knowing these five categories, will help you generate assumptions, but it's still hard, right? We're still gonna be blind to a lot of our assumptions. So I'm gonna give you another strategy to help you surface assumptions. And that's as simple as we're gonna story map our ideas. Now, if you're not, if you've never heard of story mapping, it's the yellow boxes on this slide. It's this simple. You're gonna fast forward into the future. You're gonna assume your solution already exists and you're gonna map out what does your customer have to do to get value out of this idea. So in this case, we're in our integrating local channels. So I wanna watch NBC, I wanna, I wanna watch the Olympics, they're on NBC, we're gonna integrate NBC into Netflix. What does my subscriber have to do to get value out of this? First, they have to decide to watch the game, then they have to choose a streaming service, we're hoping it's Netflix, then they have to open that service. In this case, they'd ha for this solution, they'd have to find the local channel and then they'd have to the Olympics would have to be on live and they would then watch the Olympics. The reason why this is helpful is as we get specific about what our solution means, we start to make assumptions. So if I can go step by step through this map and start to ask what needs to be true in order for my subscriber to do each step. That's what you're seeing in the gray boxes below. So in order for my subscriber to decide they wanna watch the game, they have to wanna watch sports. Right? In order for them to choose Netflix, they have to know that Netflix has sports. They have to want to watch sports on Netflix. Our service has to be available. In order for them to find NBC, for the, in order for them to choose NBC, they have to know that the Olympics are on NBC. We have to be able to partner with NBC. We have to be able to partner with NBC in a way that's viable. Right, The cost-benefit analysis has to work out. Um, the viewing experience, in order for them to watch local sport, the Olympics on NBC, we have to be able to create a good streaming experience. This is particularly relevant for, for Netflix because Netflix is able to create a great um, TV show and movie streaming experience because they, can, they have good buffering technology. But buffering changes when we're talking about a live sporting event because we don't want to buffer so much that I'm 30 minutes behind and you text me and ruin the outcome of the event, right? So this is starting to raise some feasibility assumptions. Now the benefit of doing this is some of our assumptions, especially in this case, things like our subscribers want to watch sports, they want to watch sports on Netflix, are actually assumptions about our opportunity. And if it turns out in our assumption testing, we find that those assumptions are not true, we actually can pivot. We're gonna throw out our opportunity to get all together and move to a different opportunity. Some of our assumptions distinguish our ideas from each other. So especially in this fourth column where we're getting into things like, 
We can partner with local channels. Our subscribers know what channel the game is on. Those assumptions differentiate this idea from our other ideas, and that's what's going to give us our compare and contrast data. Now, testing assumptions has another advantage. It's also faster than testing whole ideas. It often takes weeks to do all of our prototype testing. It often takes weeks to build and do A-B testing. We want to collect data in a day or two. So I'm going to give you four strategies for how to quickly test assumptions. I'm going to start with this assumption, our subscribers want to watch sports. The first way we're going to test it is we're going to prototype to simulate a specific moment. And the specific moment is what's key here. We're not going to simulate, we're not going to simulate the whole solution. We're going to look at where did it occur in the story map, and we're going to simulate just that moment. So in this case, I'm going to create a prototype to test what do you want to watch right now. I'm just going to give you some simple options. It doesn't need to be a pixel perfect um, interface design because I'm not even going to test it in the context of my product. I'm just going to put together a screen that shows some TV shows, some movies, some sporting events. If I have access to an unmoderated testing tool, I can load this up. And I'm simply going to ask, what would you like to watch right now? And I can get feedback on this in as little as a day. Right, because I can mock it up in 30 minutes to an hour because it's not a pixel perfect design. I can load it up on an unmoderated testing tool because my question is a single question. My videos that I have to process are going to take are going to be a minute or two long, not 15 minutes long. So I can rapidly collect evidence for this assumption. Second way I can test this assumption is with a one question survey. A one question survey lives within your product or service. You're not emailing people a survey. You're asking them a question while you have their attention. A great example of this is how a lot of people do their NPS surveys. They embed them directly in the product. That's the same idea. In this case, we're going to embed the survey directly in the product and we're going to ask, have you watched a sporting event in the past week? So we're going to quickly pull how many of our subscribers have watched sports in the past week. Most teams can collect a lot of responses to a one question survey in an hour or two if you have a lot of traffic, a day or two if you have less traffic. Third way we can test this assumption is to ask our customers already exhibiting the behavior we would expect to see if this assumption were true. What data do we have to look at? We can look at user analytics, we can look at search queries, we can look at we can talk to our sales teams. We can look at support tickets. We have a wide variety of data that we can look at. In this instance, we can ask, are our customers already searching for sports? So we can look at our Netflix search queries and see, our pe do people not know we don't have sports and they're already trying to find sports on our platform? These three strategies, prototyping a specific moment, one question surveys, and data mining to target a specific assumption, are going to cover the vast majority of your assumption testing. There's a fourth type of assumption test that's going to benefit your feasibility assumptions. And that's that we can run quick research spikes to test a specific assumption. A research spike is just a time box, a time box where we tell our engineers, go spend a day investigating. But we're going to give them a very clear target. We're going to give them a very specific assumption to test. So let me give you an example of this. Maybe we have a feasibility assumption that's of the form. Um, we're assuming NBC will give us appropriate metadata to be able to show event data for what's live on NBC right now, right? So maybe we, we're worried about can we display a title and a description and an appropriate image for what's on right now. So we might say, engineers, over the next 24 hours, pull all the live events as they arrive on NBC and evaluate what percentage we can display appropriately in our interface. How much custom work do we need to do to adjust the data they're giving us, right? So it's a very targeted feasibility test. Okay, so assumption testing, we're breaking our ideas down into their underlying assumptions. We're using these four strategies to test our assumptions. That's allowing us to set up a good compare and contrast decision, which is going to allow us to make better decisions about what to build. We just covered a lot of ground very quickly, so I'm going to give a quick recap. We started at the top by defining a clear outcome. Once that outcome was in place, we started with our first weekly act small research activity. We're interviewing every week to discover opportunities. 
We're mapping out the opportunity space to understand our best, best path to our desired outcome. Once we choose a target opportunity, we're setting up a good compare and contrast decision so that we make looking for a clear front runner. We're doing that by breaking our ideas down into their underlying assumptions and rapidly testing those assumptions. Now, because we covered this very quickly, I wanna let you know that everything we covered is in my book. It's called Continuous Discovery Habits. This book is available at retailers around the world. Um, the easiest place to find it is on Amazon, but you can also order it from any of your favorite independent bookstores. If they don't currently carry it in their inventory, they can order it for you. Um, I wrote this book to be a hands-on practical guide to help product, trio, pro product trios develop these habits and put them into practice. Uh, so I recommend picking up a copy. All right, I think we're ready for Q&A. Awesome. Thank you very much, Teresa. Thanks so much. Manap, I think you're on mute. No, I think we still cannot hear you, actually. Or is it just me? Now is it better? Yeah. Yes. Now, now you're here. <laughs> Okay, great. So we have okay, a few Manal, questions. Simon, you have from... some questions from YouTube? Yeah, we definitely have got a few questions that came in over YouTube. So I want to start up with this one here. Put it up on the screen from Veronica. So how do you avoid the situation where people sign up for the user interview just because they want the incentive? <laughs> yeah, so this will happen when you're using a lot of the big um, recruiting platforms, right? Because they start to encourage this sort of professional tester behavior. So for the first thing I will say is it happens less often than people think. So people make a bigger deal of this than it actually is. When you're recruiting from within your own product or service, you're gonna find this happens way less often. The other thing is, is oftentimes you don't have to offer the incentive up front. So if you ask for a small amount of time, so ask for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, not a full hour, and if you're, if you're um, if you clearly communicate what the interview is about, particularly if you communicate, we want to talk to people who are experiencing this pain point or experiencing this need. If that resonates with your customer, they're going to want to talk to you about it. And so you can actually offer the, the reward afterwards to help avoid this problem. But I will share in the teams that I work with, this is a lot rarer than the internet wants to make it seem. Right, you'll hear people talk about this and it's a huge pain point. If you're recruiting your own customers, it happens a lot less frequently than people um, uh, make it make of it. This one's from you, Manav. Maybe you want to ask it yourself. Yeah, so I guess I have my mic down there again. Yeah, so for, you know, for smaller teams or let's say for startups, um, how do you uh, make sure that tech leagues are involved in this product discovery process or continuous discovery when uh, your resources are really limited? Because you might have this for enterprises or medium-sized companies, but in startups, that's a really big challenge. Yeah, so it's a little bit counterintuitive. So you're actually going to save time. You're going to save engineering time by having your engineer involved from the beginning. Because remember, when we're doing these handoffs, we get to engineering, we end up with requirements that we can't implement. And oftentimes it takes some delivery work to find those constraints, right? So we start building and then we learn what we just built is, is not possible or it has to be adjusted and we end up with a lot of rework. Or we end up with engineers making all those little teeny tiny daily decisions that we don't realize the implications of. Like, we build the data model in a certain way that then constrains us. So it's a little bit counterintuitive, but you're actually going to save engineering time by having your tech lead involved in discovery from the beginning. And you're also going to end up with better solutions. So even if you, even if you didn't, you will save time, but even if you didn't, even if it cost you time, you'll end up with a better solution, which is going to be, which would be well worth that time spent. So there's two benefits here. You will save time in delivery and you will end up building better solutions. Yeah, that's an interesting talk because usually like, let's say my experience has been that discovery equals to time being spent. So yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's a big challenge as well, also in like big organizations. So. 
other part of this that I will say is that if you truly adopt a continuous cadence, right? So you're interviewing a customer every week, that's a 20 to 30 minute meeting that does not have to take a lot of time. As soon as we get into assumption testing, a lot of the work of assumption testing is starting the delivery work. You need your engineers testing those feasibility assumptions. You need engineers supporting things like one question surveys, right? So we're starting to bleed into the delivery work. Um, so with the interviewing, we're talking about a 20 30 to 30 minute time commitment. And with assumption mm -hmm. testing, we're already getting into engineering like work. So this doesn't have to be a heavy lift for your engineers. Okay, thanks. So there's another one from Veronica. If you work on a product that is already mature and have product teams working on different parts, journeys, should continuous discovery focus on the whole or on the individual part of part a team works on? Yeah, so this is a really good question. So your out your team's outcome is going to set the scope for your discovery. So if you can set an outcome that represents your step of the journey, that's the context you're exploring in discovery. However, it can be beneficial to understand the step before and the step after so that you're not building things that um, disrupt the rest of the journey. And some ways that teams do this is they set an outcome that helps them optimize their step of the journey and they counterbalance that outcome with some health metrics that ensure that they're not negatively impacting the other steps of the journey. So yeah, this one was for me, this was basically asking kind of, is there, because you referred to the sort of the opposite of discovery based validated decisions as expert decisions. And it's if you're working more, let's say in a platform context where you're making more decisions, which are driven by, let's say, uh, trying to reduce internal costs of delivering certain things, is there decisions which actually don't need discovery in that sense? Or should you still be comparing uh, using some kind of internal interview process with, with your internal customers uh, as a process of actually defining which solution is the, is the way to go? Yeah, so I've worked with a lot of platform teams and I would say as a platform team, your customers are your product teams. Yeah. And you should be interviewing them. And actually what even better than interviewing them because your customers are your coworkers, I would actually pair program with them. I would, I would actually take the time to uh, understand their daily work and how they're using your product or service. And as a product manager, if you can't pair program with somebody on your, um, somebody on, on that, on a product, an engineer on a product team, you can pair with that product manager and you can have one of your engineers pair with that, with their engineers, right? Mm -hmm. The key here is that because your customers are internal, you can actually observe the way that they work. And that's really beneficial. If, if I thought it was sustainable for product teams to observe their customers week over week, <laughs> that would have been my recommendation over interviewing. It's not mm -hmm. for most of us, right? But for platform teams, it is. So I would find a way to observe how your customers, your product teams are using your products and services and where they're running into problems. Cool. So Manav, you had another question. Yeah, so, you know, I'm just for the sake of it, I'm pretty recent in, in the PM world. I, I come from a software engineering background. So, you know, I wasn't invited to a lot of product uh, or internal customer interviews, let's say, for Simon's question. But uh, in the PM path, you know, I've obviously read Marty Skagen inspired book and, and your book as well now. And you just explained over the three assumptions and the two that you added. So how does it differ with Marty's uh, uh, risk categories that he's taking or talking about in Inspired, or is that somehow overlapping? Uh... Yeah, they're really similar ideas. So the one difference is I added the category ethical eth ethical risk, right? Um, Marty uses the language risk and I use the language assumptions. And here's why. I just want to remind people that what they're testing is a specific assumption. Because when we frame it as risk, like, hey, we got to test the value risk we tend to go back to trying to test the whole solution and we fall back in this project-based research. Mm -hmm. So it is the same idea. I evolved the language a little bit because in my practice coaching teams, I see that people get hung up on, they need a reminder, you should be testing a very specific assumption. So Marty talks about prototyping to, to evaluate risk. I talk about assumption testing, prototyping is one of them to test a specific assumption. And so I talk about five categories of assumptions, 
Conceptually, it's the same thing. I find that the language helps people remember that your tests should be very narrowly focused on a single assumption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the distinction is pretty much there. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have another question actually, which is around the idea that, you know, many companies are investing a lot in, in trying to become data driven. And they often interpret this as we need to have very high levels of data science happening on the digital interactions which are ha happening with our customers in our products. Have you seen cases where this has gone so far that sort of the, yeah, that the, that the discovery and contact with the customer is gone and they've actually made really, really terrible assumptions based on, on, on data? Have you seen something like that happen yet? Or Yeah, so I would argue that uh, behavioral analytics is just one data stream, right? Qualitative interviewing is another data stream. Mm. If we just rely on quantitative data, like our behavioral analytics, we're gonna do a pretty good job of optimizing our product, but we're not gonna discover adjacent opportunities. We're not gonna discover use cases that people are using our product for that we don't know about, right? It's gonna really limit um, our potential. Hmm. The best teams recognize we have lots of data streams and that we should be mixing and matching all of them, right? So when we talk about the, a good way to test assumptions is data mining, is to look at those behavioral analytics. That is a big part of our discovery work and a good uh, product trio should fully understand the current state of how people are using their product and behavioral analytics is a big part of that, but it's not the full story. Right? We have to understand the context in which that behavior is occurring, and that's going to come from collecting customer stories. Hmm. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. So, do we have anything else? Any other questions? There was one anonymous question which came in, which was, um, what do you make of community feature requests as a method for getting feedback? So basically, some I think some larger corporations you know, will have some kind of gated... I guess some kind of gated community where you use the typical PM tools to aggregate feature requests with voting systems or things like this. It's just another data stream or what, how do you see it? <laughs> yeah, those tools are another data stream and they can be really valuable for, for inspiration. Here's mm -hmm. the challenge. When mm -hmm. customers are gonna think in solutions because most humans do and it takes mm -hmm. a lot of work to get at what's the underlying need, right? So when I get a feature request, where, regardless of where it comes from, I want to make sure I'm doing the work to understand what's the implied need. So if you have product managers that are active on that platform, working with customers when they suggest a request to then mm -hmm. interview them and uncover that implied need, that's an awesome mm. data stream. Mm. If you're just taking that data stream and implementing those features without that context, you're going to build a lot of the wrong stuff. Yeah, kind of tied into the sort of big, big customer wishes extensions, mine minefield of B two B product management that you end yeah, up building. Here's what happens: we build too much when we build just feature requests. Because mm. let's say that um, customer A asks for feature one, and customer B asks for feature two, and customer C asks for feature three, and we build all all three features. What we might have missed if somebody did the work to uncover the implied need is maybe all three of those feature requests actually represent the same need. And we could have came up with feature four that solves all three customer needs and is smaller than all three of those features, mm. right? So there's this synthesis work that we, that we as the product trio have to do to really understand what is the customer asking for and why do they need it? Cool. Just got one more fresh one that came in from Oliver. Any experiences in which this framework allowed you to come up with a really disruptive innovations or how do you deal with uncovering opportunities that just a few lead users experience? Yeah, we have lots of examples of teams using this process to generate really disruptive innovations. Um, we're collecting case studies at producttalk.org. We have a category called, we have two categories. One is case studies. Those are with, those are stories of teams that I've coached or hope my partner Hope Grant has coached um, and sort of some of the innovation that, that that has led to. And then we have a product and practice series where we're also featuring other teams that are adopting the continuous discovery habits. There's two that I'll highlight. Um, we recently featured a story, it's also in the book, 
of a team based in um, uh, uh, Dubai who was a tra they work at a, on a travel product. And at the beginning of COVID, they saw their industry industry completely disrupted. Right, uh, their their market was Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia closed their borders. Tra uh, uh, travel was completely disrupted overnight. They had to hustle and find a new market to serve during the COVID pandemic. They set an outcome, they interviewed customers, they started to recognize that in Saudi Arabia, there was this very specific domestic travel opportunity they could go after. It required building a whole new product. Uh, they, they pivoted and were able to serve that, pro that, that audience. Um, we feature that story both in the book and on the blog in our product and practice series. Um, and then a second uh, a story that's also in the book and on the blog is um, I worked with a marketing automation company where they were getting hammered in the sales process because they were missing a key feature. And instead of building what the competitors had, they took it as an opportunity uh, to, com to build a much better version. Um, all the competitors had the feature, but nobody was using it. So it was, the, it was a classic case of people wanted it in the sales process, but then nobody used it. Um, and this team figured out why nobody used it, built a better version, um, so was able to meet the sales need and was able to meet the engagement over time need. Mm -hmm. Cool. Really nice. Okay, I think our our question stream is more or less run up and we're on the hour yet right now. So I think we can probably wrap up here unless any of you two have questions still. Perfect. No, I think I think we're good. Good in time as yeah. well. Thanks so much, Teresa, uh, for for your talk and for joining us uh, this evening for us, this morning for you. Um, mm. So yeah, very insightful talk as as usual. So thanks so much, and um, yeah, thank you also much for everyone joining uh, on YouTube again. Hopefully, or maybe we can host some events live soon as well. That would be great. Um, and thank you for your questions. Um, so yeah, all the best to you, Teresa, to the US from Austria and uh, to everyone at home as well. See you soon. Thanks Cheers. so much for having me. Thank you guys. Bye-bye.